Coming up on this episode of The Social Hour, 140.com's Laura Fitton on social tools, social strategy, and how she got the name at Pistachio on Twitter. Also, a Google Plus spreadsheet for you and me, the members of the Twit Army, Pandora's new look, and a wristband from Jawbone. Will it be rad or fad? All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Social Hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is the Social Hour, episode 17, with Amber MacArthur and Sarah Lane, recorded Monday, July 18th, 2011. This episode of The Social Hour is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For a free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to another episode of The Social Hour. It's episode 17 from Petaluma, California. I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Amber MacArthur. I'm still on Prince Edward Island on the east coast of Canada, enjoying uh, summertime away from the big city. So Amber, you were, I think you were somewhat unsure if you were still going to be there this time last week. You were like, yeah, maybe I'll check in from Prince Edward Island one more time. So I guess you decided to extend the vacation. Well, I'm actually going to Las Vegas tomorrow, of all places, to a speaking event. So then I'm going to come back here for a couple of days and then go back to Toronto. So, um, yes, uh, I am here until uh, tomorrow when I, I, I hear it's like 40 degrees Celsius in Las Vegas. So that's a little intense for me, Sarah. I don't know if you like that kind of heat. No, Amber, no, I don't. Uh, I actually have a, a couple of friends who are doing a joint bachelor-bachelorette party. They're getting married at the end of September, and it's going to be a very fun event. They're doing it in Las Vegas, too, and it, the whole weekend that we're there, it's in like a couple weeks from now, it's supposed to be like 110. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm gosh. like, why, why are we doing this? You know, don't they want to get to their wedding alive? Well, too warm, Sarah. Oh, yes, and 40 degrees Celsius, obviously. Yeah. I'm speaking uh, Canadian. I, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 you got I'm, I'm familiar enough with your Canadian ways to know exactly. that 40 degrees means something really, really hot in Fahrenheit. Like really darn hot. So basically. Amber, we have an amazing guest today. Yeah, so excited to have uh, Laura Fitton on the show, and uh, she was recommended by one of our listeners, so exciting to have someone who is a regular actually uh, um, provoke us to have such a wonderful guest on the show, and she is a Twitter expert, social media expert, she runs her own business, she has done a lot, I was just reading her bio, uh, she has a bunch of different projects on the go, so a perfect fit for all of the social news that we talk about on the show. Welcome, Laura, and, and many of you may know you better as your Twitter alias, Pistachio. I get called that face to face at conferences all the time. I have no problem with it for the record. What what <laughs> is just for anybody who's not familiar with you, where does pistachio come from? Are you just a fan of the nut? Almost nobody knows this story. Uh, God, a gazillion years ago, when I had my first home office, I grabbed a can of paint out of my boyfriend's basement and just painted the attic. And it was this hideous Friendly's ice cream pistachio green. <laughs> and when I needed a company name, I totally punted and went, um, Pistachio Studios. And so it's stuck ever since. It's been a company name of mine for like 14 years before Twitter came along. That's so funny. I love that. Uh, obviously, Twitter this is has crazy SEO juice. So if you Google the word pistachio, you get like the definition in Wikipedia, and then pretty high up, you get my Twitter account. Nice. Um, you've obviously evolved a little bit uh, from that as a business name. So now you're one of the founders of a company called uh, 140. I actually don't know if you have other people involved um, as far as founding the company, but you focus specifically uh, on Twitter. So uh, that's interesting. How did you, you decide to um, use that as kind of your focus of the business? Sure. Sure. Well, I really didn't want to start a startup. I'd never built software. I'd never been around software getting built. I had never managed people. I'd never even had a boss. I was a marketing consultant. Uh, but I was going nuts trying to keep track of all the different Twitter apps. And I decided there needed to be a Twitter app store and couldn't convince anybody else to do it. So it was like uh, it was like Elle Woods in Legally Blonde. I think she just woke up one day and decided <laughs> to do a startup. I was a sole founder. I am still CEO. We are a team of six people now. Uh, first employee joined, oh God, I don't know, like eight, nine months into the process. And uh, we had a bit of a, you know, pivot. I'm sure that word comes up here a lot when you guys talk about startups. Um, 
we thought we were going to be a consumer app store. We thought consumer apps for Twitter would be the big thing. And you know who showed up was business users. So we've really adapted and modified what we offer to suit them. So we still have the directory of 4,000 apps. You can add any social media app you want, and people can rate and review it. But on top of that, and so that's what you're showing there, all the business apps, on top of that, we let our users put together kits, toolkits, where they go, you know, if you're using this, you probably also want to use these three other tools to get a more comprehensive social media presence for your company. Uh, and we just launched our first SaaS product. Think about it as like a, it's like a base camp for social media. It lets your whole social media team stay really coordinated, which is so crucial because you often have one person who really knows what they're doing, like the architect, right? And then you have a ton of builders and a ton of people with hammers and a ton of people who know what a nail looks like but haven't really done a lot of it and don't feel comfortable. So this helps them all collaborate and, and do a great job. Laura, I remember coming across 140 when I started getting really into Twitter, and yeah, just like you said, it was one of these ooh the, uh, consumer um, resources for me, where I could say, oh, this is a great third-party application. Ooh, that's neat. That makes Twitter more interesting in this way. How do the tools change, or do the trends change once you focus more on business rather than fun? Sure, sure. Well, so we still have all the fun listings there, and we still hear about new apps all the time that are fun. Um, but the focus really was on, you know, the most frequent visitors to the site were those business users. So we do a ton of content on the blog. Our director of marketing, Janet Aronica, is just incredible. She's got a freelance team, and then she writes a lot of the posts herself, demystifying and debunking all the stuff you need to know about social media tools, which ones really work well for which use cases. Um, so that was a huge shift of it. And, of course, rolling out an actual subscription product that, you know, we call social base. That was a big step because when you're a consumer site, you're just all about the ratings and the reviews and the user-generated content and we'll figure out how to make money someday. When you go B2B, you need to really deliver some business value and solve people's problems. Do you find that most companies, um, they're just not, they just don't have that one social media maven or, or you know, the person who's running everything? It's, it's a team effort to the point, to the point where someone's going to say, $80 a month makes a lot of sense for us. We need this. Yeah, we very much designed it with that in mind. Um, the people who buy it tend to be replacing, not replacing their agency so much as scaling what the agency is telling them, right? Because they're getting all this great advice. But as soon as you go from the person who really knows what they're doing to the person in the company who's hearing the advice to mm -hmm. all the other people who have to carry out the marching orders, it's just a whisper down the lane problem and things get way out of sync. Add to that, most companies are using 8 to 12 different tools to manage their presence because each tool does different things and kind of all fit together. Right. It just gets chaotic and you're wasting a lot of time and so that becomes a very, very cheap expenditure by contrast. I'm curious what advice uh, you would give people out there, because I get this question all the time, in terms of how often you should post on Twitter to get the best results and the most significant increase in the number of followers and quality of followers. Yeah, yeah. Well, and of course, I'm sure you, like me, always say, like, look, don't worry about the quantity, worry about the quality, because you'll get much more message amplification and people clicking through your links and passing on what you're saying from a really, really engage small group on Twitter than you will from a massive group that you like said hey everybody I want to get to a thousand followers recommend me you know um, so that's you know definitely the first thing other tips um, I don't think there's a set number of tweets per day I think that really depends on the individual I think a lot of it is getting in touch with why you're there what you want to do with it and who you are so that you can connect with the right people who want to follow you. Like some clusters on Twitter love to tweet all day long, and that's what they do. Others that are using it in more of a keep on top of industry news mindset really appreciate accounts that only update five to ten times a day. So it's going to be different for each person. It's going to be different for different kinds of companies, and you really have to find what's effective. To measure effectiveness, Okay, everybody looks at follower number, and I swear it's so not important. What does matter are people retweeting you. Are they favoriting your tweets? Are they clicking through? Make sure you're using trackable links in your tweets so that you can see which ones work and which don't. I also love the apps. There's a bunch now. Timely, uh, another Canadian entrepreneur, Dan Martel, although he did relocate to Silicon Valley. 
uh, buffer app, Leo Widrich, and I just saw a new app that does this. Uh, hopefully the name will come to me. They, they sit as bookmarklets in your browser, and as you're reading and you find great stuff that would be valuable and interesting to your readers, you can bookmark them, set up the tweet right then, and these systems feed them into the stream when they see a lot of uh, traction and engagement on your account, and they think your audience is most likely to be there. Huh. Neat. Use a little I caution. Love, I though. love that. It, does that, does that, it, it doesn't come across as cheating at all. I mean, I know that some people think, well, you, know, you have to be as, as transparent right. and human as possible. When you start automating things, do you get into gray areas? You definitely get into great areas. So gray areas. So an important tip with that is once you've scheduled a bunch of tweets, take a glance at the schedule and get a sense of when approximately they're going to run and mm -hmm. try and be there when they go up so you can respond. Right? So you might think it defeats the purpose of scheduling them if you then have to show up. But the idea is we tend to do our reading and our consuming of media in very concentrated doses. Like, you know, the way we attack our inbox, the way we attack our Google Reader. Your readers don't necessarily want to see seven great articles in the half hour that you spent reading. Right. Right. So it's more valuable to them to have it spread out. So there's a balance. I think if you're using anything that's heavier automation than that, it's a good idea to write in your bio. This is a partly automated account. That way people don't feel bad if they respond to something you posted and you're just not there and it's crickets. I'm sense. curious um, as well in terms of the company name 140, the focus on Twitter. How do you guys scale right now with other services like Google Plus taking up uh, so much attention from the social media crowd? Sure, sure. We, we settled on that name um, to avoid, at the time, all Twitter apps were being named TWI and then something else, right? I'm sure it was <laughs> I mean, you guys that it, right? Um, of the original database of 1,200 apps, 750 of them started with T, and 670 of those started TW. So it was just total noise. So we wanted to honor and kind of salute our Twitter roots. I wrote Twitter for Dummies, so I was very much coming into this from a Twitter-centric view no matter where we went in the future. So we chose 140 where we're not locked into the Twitter name, but obviously that's kind of where we came from. And also the other platforms do tend to be adopting fairly short status updates. They're not the exact number of characters of Twitter, but it's not that big a deal. It's kind of a more, you'd be surprised how many people don't get what the name refers to. We get that <laughs> question a lot. Do you find that, I, I know, I guess before Twitter bought Tweety, um, there was so much more emphasis on third-party applications that made Twitter more helpful, that, uh, that helped it, I don't know, had just have more features than just stripped down Twitter had. Obviously over time, internally, Twitter has tried to roll out all of the tools that are the most helpful for the most amount of, of people using the service so that people don't have to rely on third-party apps. How much do you have to comb through your very, uh, extensive list of apps that work well with Twitter to make sure that you're not recommending something that you know the API doesn't work anymore or is just no longer useful it seems like a full-time project <laughs> <laughs> well you know we're a community site so users flag apps that have gone inactive and our focus has shifted as we went B2B away from you know oh the database is everything to mm -hmm. like okay the database is a great first layer but we need to add a lot of value on top of that, showing which tools work well together, showing blog content and ebooks and stuff like that that explain how to use it, and then of course sitting at the top there, our engagement console social base. Um, so honestly, it's you know it's user generated. Anybody can submit an app, rate an app, complain about an app, comment on an app, and it all gets pretty much figured out. Last question for me, just uh, to follow up a little bit on uh, my previous question. How do you think things are going to pan out in the social media world, you know, with Twitter and Google Plus and Facebook? Do you th see one kind of winning out? Or are they all still very important uh, in terms of getting your message out there and building community? So, I mean, you look back at technology and there are these life cycles, right, of, of someone's the young up-and-comer and then they come out of nowhere and then they're the Borg and everybody wants to go after them and then someone else is the up-and-comer and then they're the Borg and you know certainly companies like MySpace decline, companies like Friendster decline. I think we'll continue to see churning, changing cycles all the time. I think Google Plus is a really new entrant. I don't you know I haven't had enough time to play with it so I'm not running around prognosticating like oh it's the death of Facebook, it's the death of Twitter. <laughs> But I think it would be really, like, what would make you believe that any one company was going to dominate for decades and decades and decades? It's just not how it's been working. Mm -hmm. 
So Definitely. I expect unpredictability. Last question for me too, Laura. I, I, I always come across people, obviously Amber and I are big fans of social media and, and using it not only just to, for social and again fun, but business use as well is, is extremely important and, and can be really effective. Why is it that some people have this issue and there's some sort of a stigma with being a, a social media manager? I mean, I, I guess it's because it, it seems like a job that you could kind of half-ass or I, I I come across people all the time who go, oh, God, oh, the social media experts. Everybody's a social media expert. There really are experts, though, aren't there? Of course. Of course, there really are. I think two different things are going on there. One is that there's tons of pretenders. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, because social media, you know, isn't that well understood. I mean, I think when phone first came into the workplace, when email first came into the workplace, it was dismissed as this trivial, time-wasting thing. What could possibly be the business use of that? So I think as the cycles mature, we certainly know the phone is a really important business tool. We certainly know email is. We certainly know now that social is. Um, but there is there is still that preconceived, oh, it's fluffy, it's kind of light. And then there really is a glut of people. And this is even valid too, right? Honestly, if you've been blogging for two years in a small town, you probably are valuable to all the local retailers in helping them get up and running on social media. Yeah. Are you able to define Ford's social media policy? Of course not, right? So I think the, the last thing I'll comment on is that it is a skill in the workplace of the future. It is no longer going to be a job title. We don't still have the expert of phone or the you know, VP of email. Um, so I think it's a process of going from people who really do specialize and that's all they do to, yeah, a few people will still set, specialize, just as there are graphic designers and there are art directors and there are ad buyers, and those are very specialized Marcom functions. Um, but I also think the actual skill needs to, to spread over the entire organization. At That's some really point, cool. R&D will use social media. At some point, even accounting will use social media. And it's hard to imagine yet, but once upon a time, it was hard to imagine email on that either. Very true. Excellent. Very true. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been great having on you, you on the show, and uh, we'll be watching everything that you do. And um, I just added you as a friend because I know you're on Google Plus as well. So uh, I'll watch as you're experimenting there too. All right. I hope I get around to it. I'm running a startup, and I'm also a single mom. My little baby is six today. My little oh, happy birthday, little baby. My older daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thanks, Sarah. It was wonderful to meet you both. Really fun to come on the show. Thank you. Thanks so much, Laura. And follow Laura again at Pistachio on Twitter. She she kind of knows what she's doing. Let's be honest. Bye, Laura. <laughs> have a great day. See you later. Go have some cake. <laughs> <laughs> so, Amber, uh, that that was. If people really are, if you've just spent a little bit of time at 140, it's amazing how much they actually have to to recommend to you, and it really runs the gamut. I mean, business tools, uh, again, personal stuff. I know Laura says that they they focused a lot more on on the business side of things more recently, but you know they've got clout, for example. You know that's that's front and center. That's something that we've talked about in the past. You know that's sort of new and exciting. And in fact, uh, people are getting uh, Spotify accounts through clout accounts. I know. So it's I worth looking that. at that sort of thing. But yeah, I, I um I really this has been a resource um for me for for years. Um I wasn't actually really aware that there was a pivot that had happened, but I appreciate um that they had a good reason for it. You know. Yeah, and I really loved her last point that she made about uh, social media becoming a skill. Uh, so not necessarily a uh, position title, but something there where people say, well, you know, I'm skilled in social media, just like we used to say, you're, you know, someone was skilled in word processing, right? So I think that was a really interesting uh, thing that she said at the end. So great to have her on. And I can't remember the name of the uh, uh, one of our listeners who recommended her, but thank you. Absolutely. All right. So let's remind people now where they should go when they want to know more about what we talked about in the show. Well, and yes. Find uh, previous episodes. Of course, uh, they can find us online at twit.tv slash TSH and uh, get our show notes uh, and uh, subscribe to the podcast and get all the information. So that's a great re resource to go to as well. And of course, we're live, Sarah, every week. 2 p.m. That's right. Eastern. 
11 a.m. Pacific, uh, and you can watch us live. Uh, or if you're not able to watch us live, of course, subscribe to the podcast, and you can email us at the social hour at twit. TV. So lots of ways to get in touch with us and find us. Sometimes we change around the hours a little bit, Sarah. We try not to, but uh, uh, we'll let you know on our Twitter accounts or Google Plus or somewhere if there's a change in the live stream. Absolutely. And it's worth reminding people, we have been reminding you thus far that this is technically our last episode oh, yes, in the studio the as we know it here, which is the one that I fumble through every Monday morning. And Amber is too nice to say, Sarah, get your act together. Uh, because it's, um, it's, it's, been a, it's been a good it's been a good run in the studio thus far, but we are. The, the entire TWIT team is moving. I, I, I point this way because physically that's actually where our studio is. Uh, just down the road a little bit. Um, and I'm not going to be running the board anymore if all goes well in one week. And in fact, Chad, who's, who's, who's standing off uh, in the wings here is is going to take over. So he and I just have to like get on the same page and kind of have that like unspoken wink wink type thing when it's love when, it. Yeah, so he can follow along with us, but it'll actually take a lot of the pressure off both of us when we're live. We can just sit there and talk. It's going to be awesome. So are you still going to put me on the couch, Sarah? Uh, I sure hope so. Yeah, I haven't actually been over there since Leo and I had the weird idea to make you like this sort of avatar bot uh, sitting in a in a Skype window <laughs> long ways <laughs> portrait mode sitting on sitting on a chair next to me but I think that's still the idea and if it isn't then we'll just figure out uh a better, uh, a, like a, a, a better set to use because we actually have many to choose from, which is awesome. All right, Amber, before we get on to the rest of our show, we definitely want to thank Audible for being our sponsor. Audible is, well, it's pretty much the best way to listen to like 75,000 different audiobooks to choose from. I mean, you have so many choices. If you haven't browsed through audiobooks on Audible, here's what you do. If you go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour, um, you can get a free book. So this is the sort of this is the sort of thing that's great for people who are not really used to the audiobook world because it's obviously very different than sitting down and reading a book and turning the pages or or even reading an ebook. Um, having a book read to you is a very different experience. So you definitely want to take advantage of just trying a book out. And getting a sense for, oh, okay, this is kind of how I consume it. And, and you can sort of close your eyes and, and let your imagination run wild. And, and it can be so good for if you're a commuter or if you're stuck in the car or, uh, you know, or you're, you're, you're at the airport. you got to kill some time. And you just don't feel like putting your, your nose into a book. You just want to put on your headphones and, and zone out. At the gym, the gym is another I always use as a great example because... I don't particularly like going to the gym, but I'm much more um, interested in sitting there on a bike for an hour if I've got a cool book to read. Amber, what are what are, what are some of your uh, the books that you've been? Uh well, I'm glad you asked, Sarah. Um, <laughs> I always I like to you. look around at books while uh, you're introducing the ad because there's always so many great new books on Audible. Um, although this book is not a new book on Audible, I thought it would be particularly relevant because we've talked so much recently about Google Plus and Google in terms of what they're doing with mm -hmm. all their new products and services. I'm a huge fan of Jeff Jarvis, uh, who is a uh, friend of the and host on the Twit Network. And I did read his book uh, a couple years ago, What Would Google Do? Mm -hmm. And I just looked it up to see if it was available. It is as an audiobook um, and Jeff Jarvis actually uh, uh, narrates it as well so it's uh, nine hours long and uh, I, I really really Ooh. <laughs> I, I was trying to play Jeff Jarvis's book I don't know exactly know what happened there there's some music playing oh it must be my Pandora that's what it is all right here let's see if we let's see if we can listen to Jeff Jarvis in the background keep going Amber sorry to startle you no problem I'm I'm unstartled I uh, but it is a really great book so it could be a good pick for anyone who uh, wants to just get a glimpse into the uh, world of Google but obvious PowerPoint lines helpful in employee and anybody who listens to this week in Google is like ah Jeff's familiar voice in a year to it's 16, Jeff at the end doing of 2007 his thing. and to 20,000 before the end of the following year that's all you get, guys. That's all you That's get. That's it. Just to tease people. Exactly. Not the whole book. We just want to tease you a little bit with Audible. But again, if you're interested in this book, get it for free right now. We're giving you a free book. Jeff Jarvis, in fact. He's like, please, have my book for free. Listen to it. What would Google do? Audiblepodcast.com slash social hour is the link that you use to get your free book. And then Audible knows that, you, uh, that you're a fan of our show as well. So everybody wins. Thanks to Audible, of course, as always, for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. It's a great service. 
Um, and I mean, geek books galore, and everything else too. I mean, if you're <laughs> if you're a sci-fi fan, they got you covered. Fantasy, uh, mystery, nonfiction. I mean, it's it's a little bit of everything. All right, Amber. Moving on to something called grocery chain that you added into our lineup. I don't know anything <laughs> about this story. So okay, what is so, going uh, on? <laughs> Hey, okay, so this is a story about a grocery uh, chain called Publix, which is mm -hmm. uh, very popular, particularly in Florida. You know, I spend a decent amount of time there. We just bought a place there earlier this year. Yeah. And, and uh, um, I was reading about their Facebook strategy. And in fact, even though uh, this is uh, in our news uh, section, it's actually a bit of a tip for people out there who are managing uh, Facebook accounts. It looks like since Publix uh, decided to sign up for Facebook with all of the different stores that they have in Florida, that they are getting approximately 100 new friends a minute. What? Uh, fairly, yeah, fairly substan substantial. But the best thing I, I read in this article from Read Right Web is just one of the reasons that they're doing so well. They have the basic things that you'd expect from a grocery store like coupons and deals and their own recipe section and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but they also have some really great tips as far as uh, commenting guidelines for the audience and the community that they're building there. And this is something that people forget about a lot because I get this question all the time from people going into social media. They say, okay, I'm going on Facebook, but how do I manage the community and all the negative reaction and if people are swearing? wearing on the page and you know how do we moderate all that and I always recommend that you have commenting guidelines and just tell people straight out that it's a PG uh, place and you're not going to allow swearing or vulgarity or, or, or racial comments attacks on anyone and so uh, Publix if you're reading the read write, write web article they've done a really good job of just having really simple guidelines in place for uh, commenting and uh, also uh, sharing things like their employees social media guidelines so um, just a, a, a more of a tip but but uh, definitely a headline as well as far as how a grocery store has become so successful almost overnight on Facebook. Well, that's really, you don't think about grocery stores getting social media right. Um, but then again, you can always think of, if you've got a favorite grocery store that you go to once a week or however however often you go, you're loyal. And yes. you want the, the company to treat you well because you're... Um, obviously contributing to you know their their overall um, goal which is to get your money and it makes a lot of sense I mean in, in this read right web article I love this tough questions area where someone uh, said listen where's your seafood come from that's a question a lot of people have now as people know a little bit more about farmed versus wild salmon and and things like that and to have somebody from uh, the company write back a thoughtful answer and be honest about it and and be transparent about that even if it's not really an answer that you want to hear as long as you feel like you're actually getting the straight story I think that's extremely helpful for any company that wants particularly wants repeat business Oh, definitely. And I think, you know, just to pick on what you just said, one thing that, um, you know, I just thought of as soon as I read the article was how much time I spend in my local grocery store. I mean, literally, I probably go to the grocery store every couple of days and I spend more money there than I spend anywhere else. Um, there's no comparison. It been, must spend, you know, a couple hundred dollars every week just buying groceries. And uh, it, it's funny because they don't do anything with social media. And I find it kind of frustrating because I know if they did, if they were on Twitter, if they were using Facebook, if they had four square special whatever it might be, I definitely would find myself probably going there even more, but at least being able to take advantage of some coupons and offers and, and different deals, um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, that doesn't exist. So I'll have to spend more time in Florida and shop at Publix. <laughs> shop at Publix. Publix, you got Amber's business. It's funny, <laughs> Amber, you just mentioned Foursquare Specials. This was something that came out last week, but it didn't actually roll out, at least for me, until Foursquare pushed out its mo most recent uh, app update where they have actually teamed up with Foursquare has been doing specials for some time now somewhat limited but um, you can you know if you've got I have Foursquare open right now it's like these are specials that if you you know you just go to your account and you go to the explore tab there's a there's a specials tab so this is not brand new this is something that they've been playing around uh, a, a little bit for a while and you can actually see these are 
these are I, I'm looking uh, location based. So this is uh, the Puma outlet. There's a bunch of outlet stores that are somewhat close to us. There are check-in specials here and there, loyalty specials. If you're somebody that you know you, you go to Starbucks once a week, that type of a thing. Swarm specials. That means if you're maybe in a you know crowded place at a soccer game with a bunch of other people, you're part of a swarm because a bunch of people have checked in. So Foursquare is is not new to the idea of rewarding people for using the service, but they've teamed up with other companies that are more well known for kind of coupon type stuff, Living Social, for example, Guilt, um, which we've talked about. Uh, I talk about them on Twitter all the time just because I love uh, the service. So it actually really opens up what Foursquare can offer their customers because they're teaming up with companies who, who, who do similar stuff. And in many cases, they kind of do specials better and they already have yeah. the infrastructure built out a little bit more. Um, what's been kind of interesting for me is trying to figure out, well, what's a Foursquare deal and what isn't? Um, and the only thing that I ca can figure out, because I first learned about this uh, through a Mashable article, is um, they had said uh, in, in their article here, the only way that it, it, it looks any different from within the app is that it's called special offer. So it's not a loyalty check-in, it's not a swarm special, it's just called sort of that cryptic special offer. So if I find a special offer right here, this is uh, at Circle Bank. Wow, a special offer at a bank. Okay, so I go ahead and click on that. The special offer is first few check-ins, introduce themselves to the bank manager, get a free four gigabyte flash drive. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> That's really awesome. Wow, I want to belong to Circle Bank. That's awesome. So yeah, and then it's it'll it'll tell you if this is something that you can buy ahead of time. This particular offer, obviously you have to be checked in, so you'll unlock the special when you check in. So it's a it's a three check-in type of a thing. But I really like the idea of, of Foursquare. You know, they, they've got to know that as far as the game aspect of mm -hmm. services like this, they're not alone. Uh, Facebook's doing it with a lot of success. Google is getting into this game as well. I mean, just to mention a couple of the big guys, not to mention all of the, uh, the kind of Foursquare clones that do this. So I guess they just get stronger uh, the, more, the, the more deals they can offer us. That is really cool. Yeah, I mean, it makes perfect sense for them. And I think when you're catching people on the fly, when they're actually physically, you know, checking in and they're, you know, kind of in that moment, right? You have such a great opportunity to offer them specials like this and allow them to check out uh, different deals that are available. So that's neat. Not a surprise, but neat. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Another thing, Amber, I wanted to mention that uh, I actually meant to mention when we were talking about uh, YouTube's new look, which, is, which was Cosmic Panda. I think that was last week's show. Might Best been name ever, Sarah. <laughs> Cosmic Panda. Ooh, I know. Which, uh, I mean, it's every, ever since I switched over to Cosmic Panda, I mean, that is now my default view. And I notice a lot of other people are like, oh, hey, YouTube looks different. So I guess it's, uh, it's going to stay. What I, I wanted to mention, and for whatever reason we didn't get to it, is that if you are somebody who's very interested in using YouTube, but um, interested in taking it up a notch a little bit um, and, and want to know what kind of a video library you might have at your disposal via YouTube, there actually is one. And most people think, oh, you know, you can't just like use other people's videos on YouTube. That's, you can't do that, right? That's, that's not your stuff. There's actually a new Creative Commons tag that people can give their videos. Well, it's not really a tag, it's a category that works a lot like the way that people uh, use this feature on Flickr. So if you have a video which is not to be shared um, for any, you know, personal or commercial purposes, of course you say, you know, all rights reserved. So we're familiar with that. And a Creative Commons license, even though there are a few versions of Creative Commons licenses, for the most part is, um, you're allowing uh, people to use your content with attribution. Um, that's, that's sort of the common way to do that. And people can um, allow you to do that by adding this Creative Commons attribution license that's on their videos. Cool. So if you're interested, like, okay, well, hmm, what do I have to choose from? You can actually just sort of start browsing through a lot of the Creative Commons tagged videos and you know, there's actually quite a bit. There's I mean, a it, lot, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you, and it's, you want like a, I don't know, a sweeping vista or a sunset picture or just some like dogs running down a field or all, there's all sorts of stuff that, you know, we, we in the business call B-roll, just content that you might want to drop into a video and you just, you don't have it, you don't have time to go shoot it yourself or you, or you don't have the resources. 
Good stuff. Uh, and I would not have thought of YouTube as a place that's really friendly for sharing video, but it turns out uh, in certain circles, you're going to find what you're looking for. That is good to know, especially, I know this isn't in our rundown, Sarah, but especially since a headline that happened over the past few days where uh, Lady Gaga got her YouTube account removed because of a copyright violation. I guess she was on a Japanese game show or something and, and had put some of the video onto her account and YouTube actually pulled her account down because the, um, the uh, content creators, I guess the people behind the game show uh, had complained and uh, her account is now uh, back up and running. But if they're going to pull down Lady Gaga's account, out, you know, chances are if you're using copyrighted material that uh, you should probably, uh, <laughs> right. you know, stop soon and use something from Creative Commons. Lady Gaga, check for Creative Commons licenses, please. Love Seriously. your hair, though. Good uh, stuff. Funny enough, though, I didn't realize that uh, she was the first person, I guess it, uh, I had seen this headline, but I forgot about it. Uh, she was the first person ever to get to a total of one billion views on YouTube. So just un unbelievable. Yeah, she's uh, she she's a force of nature, that's for sure. She just has to make sure that she gives people attribution. <laughs> or of course. She, her account will be suspended again. That's, that's <laughs> somewhat embarrassing, but it it's, wouldn't be the first time this has happened. Uh, something I wanted to share, Amber, with you, if you haven't seen it yet, and certainly all of our uh, just social hour audience viewers and listeners, is, well, all right. Amber, do you use Pandora? Are you a Pandora fan? Well, yes. I mean, I've been a Pandora fan for years, and uh, we've had uh, Tim on the show, the founder, many mm -hmm. times, I think. And the only problem is now Pandora in many countries is blocked, including in Canada. Um, so if you go to Pandora.com in Canada right now, you'll see a letter that's been there forever from Tim Westergren. That explains that, uh, um, unfortunately, they're not, not allowed to uh, broadcast Pandora in Canada, and uh, they're trying to work something out, which probably isn't going to happen. Nonetheless, I'm a huge fan, and I know in the U.S. Uh, it's enormously popular and a wonderful service. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big Pandora fan also, and, yeah, and apologies to anybody who's listening internationally and going, well, we'd love to love Pandora, but we can't get it yet. Um, hopefully, you will get it sooner or later and you'll know why I like it so much. Pandora's gotten a lot of attention. Obviously, they IPO'd recently, so that was a big deal for them, but then they also have had a, a, a good amount of competition, most recently with Spotify, yes, which just recently course. launched in the U.S., which is a huge deal. But what they've also done is uh, updated their web experience quite a bit. Um, I actually just I have my George Michael radio station paused right now. That was what I had... Uh, um, accidentally played for you guys for like two seconds uh, a little bit earlier in the show it's a really good radio station by the way highly recommend it <laughs> but uh, if you look at if you're familiar with Pandora at all you'll see well this doesn't look at all like the Pandora that I use on the web now originally I thought does it really matter how much they redo a website that's all about listening to the radio because usually I just have a tab open um, I actually use Pandora more uh, via an app than the web, but if I am using it on the web, I'm not really looking at a page much longer than maybe reading, you know, about the artist. <laughs> I don't need to read about Madonna. I know enough about her, for example. But if it was a more obscure song on my dubstep radio station, for example. But what they've also done, they've also got something now called uh, Pandora. Oh, no, that Pandora, that's not uh, actually, is it? No, Pandora 1. Where is the area? Oh, ooh, I know where it is. It's, I'm still trying to figure out how this all works. Uh, they have an area where you can start following people. And it's not exactly like Twitter, but you can find friends who are also using Pandora via Facebook is the way that I started to, to link up with a few people. Because um, so far, you can share radio stations on Pandora and you can share particular links so mm -hmm. Amber you could listen to my George Michael station and my thumbs up and thumbs down where I kind of make the station smarter based on what I like would also apply to you but we wouldn't really be connected via Pandora as friends where I could see what you'd been listening to in the past a little oh, bit okay. more of like a last FM type of a thing sure so it's uh it's cool I mean it's it seems like something that it was uh, long overdue, really, in order to keep up. I mean, you, you kind of got to do social for music, especially since Spotify is getting so much attention uh, recently by how easy it is for people to share playlists with each other and like each other's music. And and um, that's uh, that's something that um, is, is helpful, I think, when you're trying to use a music service uh, to its full potential. 
it it's it's better as a community service because you end up uh, discovering so much more music when other people are involved. Yeah, and I mean, one thing I can say for sure, and I'm sure you would agree, is that uh, Tim and the Pandora team are constantly reinventing themselves. So even if there's competition out there with, from services like Spotify, um, I, I love how he just keeps pushing forward, even though, you know, during difficult times, and he said so many issues of broadcasting in other countries and in, in the U.S. as well. So uh, it's great to see uh, this uh, new layout. So I'm, I'm looking at it right now. You can just check it out, even if you don't get Pandora, pandora.com slash new Pandora. It looks really, really slick. Yeah, it's good stuff. It is. Uh, I, I'm really enjoying just not only just a new look. Um, and again, this will be rolled out to 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 the public uh, soon, pretty soon. Um, I uh, was lucky enough to be able to to get a, a working model um, a little bit before, um, I guess, the masses. So that's kind of fun. Yeah, they've got Love different it. skins, and yeah, it just gives it gives Pandora a little something extra that I think it was lacking for a while. Yes, it looks better. But that's not really the point. I think the social, uh, the social aspect of it is really, um, it's going to make it stand out and kind of just get up to uh, 2011 with everybody else. Watch out, Spotify. <laughs> uh, Sarah, you have a really interesting uh, uh, social tip, uh, a, a link that I've been playing with a little bit, uh, where you can create uh, a temporary email address. And I love this idea. I just created one for myself. Did you? This is called Temp Alias. And... I found it by accident using StumbleUpon. Well, anybody who's familiar with StumbleUpon knows that this is really where StumbleUpon shines when I just sort of go like, I'm just going to troll some tech stuff. Um, I'm going to, um, they actually have a new iPad app. So I've been using StumbleUpon a lot more than I even do normally, which is quite a bit. And I, sometimes I just want to look at websites that are tech related to see if they'll serve up some stuff that ends up being good for one of the shows. Temp Alias was one of those sites that StumbleUpon offered to me. And the, the premise is really simple. Sometimes you want to sign up for a service or a product or for whatever reason you have to enter your email. You don't really feel comfortable doing that. Um, whether you think it's shady or, or you just don't want to have your email address given to another service where it might be sold or shared with somebody and you end up getting more spam. So you create an alias and it's neat because it's a very temporary alias, so you, you do have to give them your real email. They don't store them anywhere. But then you can also say, let's say uh, you want this email to be valid for seven days or until you get five received messages because maybe you're under the impression that you're going to have to click a few times when the service sends you updates, that kind of thing. At that point, your, uh, your alias is generated. And you can use that, and when the, the, uh, the, the time allotted runs out, or you get the amount of messages that you said, and that's how many I want before I want this to go away, the alias is destroyed. And it won't work anymore. I mean, it won't work for you. Nobody else has it either. And the service that has that email can never bother you again because that temporary alias isn't going to go anywhere anymore. Amber, what can you think of something that... That, that you could use this for that's a good example for anybody at home who's like, well, I, I, don't, I can't think of when this would be helpful for me. I can't, the only thing I could think of, Sarah, and not that I have any experience in this, of course, but I was thinking for anyone who was dating, <laughs> that if you wanted, you know, maybe you wanted someone, you wanted to give someone your email address, because let's face it, you know, how often do we actually exchange phone numbers anymore? Yeah. And you didn't want to give them your real email address, but you would still want to maybe get the email to see if they were you know, legit, um, you could try something like this. Um, unfortunately, uh, I know when you generate a new email, uh, it, it's, it says the full, it says tempalias.com in the email. So um, if they're not a techie, maybe they wouldn't read that and think it was just some random company. But <laughs> if they could. It's probably better for a service whose feelings aren't going to get hurt. Exactly. <laughs> Rather yeah. than someone where you're like, five dates in, not working out. Not working out. Don't I don't want to get an email from you. It would be interesting. I, I'm sure there's, I want to see if there's actually stories on the uh, uh, Tempelius blog to see how people are using it. It would be kind of uh, fun. People always come up with creative ideas. So um, Yeah, maybe, um, they, I, maybe they have some, uh, some, some case studies on, in their blog area. By the way, if you, if you wonder, Temp Alias, am I really going to remember to do that anytime I've got to just quickly add in my email address? They actually have browser plugins. They have a bookmarklet, which obviously works uh, cross-browser, or a Google Chrome extension, which I think is probably, I mean, if you're the kind of person who would want to use a service like this, that makes the most sense because you can just add it to whatever page you're already on and it'll, yeah. it'll populate as much as, it, as much as it can. It's good stuff. And yeah, of course, a completely cool. free service. 
Love it. And you know what? It may not be handy right now, Sarah, but you never know. It's the type of site that you need to have in your back pocket, potentially. I, I agree with you. I agree with you, too. So, Amber, you had sent, uh, I guess, I, I don't know if it was an email. It was actually a Google Plus message uh, to you that, um, that uh, oh, did you delete that? Oh, did no, I, I, oh, did I delete it? I think you it? might have, yeah. Oh, man. All right. Did well, okay, so you set it up, and I'll show you the, the spreadsheet at the same time. Okay, perfect. So um, this was kind of interesting. Uh, we just, uh, I think both of us got it, Sarah, on Google+. Plus. Uh, one of our listeners had written in and uh, talked about a really in innovative way to be able to uh, create almost like public circles that people could follow along with. And I guess from my understanding from the email that he had sent or the Google Plus uh, note that he had sent that he had done this for Twit listeners. Yeah. Uh, yeah, kind of interesting. Create almost like a, a fan base uh, within uh, the Google Plus environment. So he has details about how he did it within uh, the note that he sent to us uh, on Google Plus. It's very meta, all of this, Sarah. It, it uh, really is very meta. But I think the idea... Uh, so we've got Twit hosts and personalities. We have a bunch of people who are now opening this up because they're watching. Uh, we have guests. Obviously, Amber, you and I are part of this. Employees that work at Twit. And then um, volunteers as well. Uh, obviously, many guests who, who are on um, semi-regularly to one or many of our shows. But then there's like this whole Twit fans area where people can voluntarily. I mean, this is a completely public spreadsheet. Add their information. Like, here's my Google+. Plus permalink so you can go and add me um, to one of your circles here's my Twitter handle here's my handle in chat you know if they're if they're one of the people who likes to hang out in the Twitch chat room which is great um, what they do for their day job if they want to add that kind of information where they're located if they want to add that kind of information and what I love especially um, and I love it because some of the people say that they they love the social hour is there's a little notes area where people can tell us what they like most about Twit, you know, what's their favorite show, or or how did they find out about uh, Leo, or you know, did, have they have they followed us from way back in the day, and it's sort. Of, I think it's what it what it can be really helpful for is we get so many questions from from fans who say I like Google Plus, so this is you know pretty Google Plus centric, um, although obviously there's Twitter handles as well. I just don't know how to build a community, and here you yeah. go with all these like-minded Twit fans, where we all have a lot of things in common because we're interested in the same stuff. Where you, where you don't have to feel alone. Yeah, no, it's really neat, and I just I finally found the post, so I can uh, get the facts a little more straight in my end. But I, it's yeah, I think I might, I might have deleted that email. I'm sorry. It's okay, Sarah. It's Mondays. I Mond know. It's Mondays. Oh, my gosh. It mu without an S. Um, <laughs> so uh, Chris Porter had sent this to Chris us. Chris Porter, and that's right. At the time that he sent it, which I believe was just this morning, uh, he was saying uh, after a few days of creating it, there, was about, there were about 400 um, uh, Twit fans who had linked their G Google Plus profiles to this list. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's fun just to check out the spreadsheet and, and see all of the information on it. There's a lot. Yeah, it's it's really it, it's cool to uh, to learn about all of you. So thanks to everybody who's participated so far and and you know for sharing your information. And again, it gives us a really good idea of not only who you are and where you are and what you do for fun, but what you like about Twit. And it makes us all feel like we're kind of in it together. So thanks so much, uh, Chris Porter, for alerting us to this. And awesome. uh, he he also had sent us um, a thread uh, just that uh, pertained to this. Um, that he was, he had also linked to the the Google spreadsheet as well, but just kind of a, a topic on Google Plus uh, for people who were interested in participating. What everybody thought. So, Chris, yeah, thank it, you. And it, it just kind of creates the community that you know you can share stuff with this community, and they'll be interested in it. You know, if I have something really techy, and I think, okay, this isn't going to be relevant to my, you know, my friends on uh, Google Plus who uh, maybe have no interest in tech, at least I could isolate it to one specific community. So. It's neat. Um, a lot of people are opening it right now, Sarah. I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> I know. It's a little overwhelming, isn't it? It sure is. We got another um, email from, um, who was it? I want to make sure I get this right. I, if anyone ever wonders why I always have so much problem with our spreadsheet, it's, well, it's a long story. Let's just say the Google, Google spreadsheets sometimes don't do exactly what I want them to do. This is from Luis, who is a social software product manager. Um, he was uh, catching up on episode 14, and someone had asked us about social tools for the enterprise, which again, 
also brings us back to 140 and, and talking with Laura Fitton earlier in the show because she knows a lot about that. So 140 is a very good resource. But uh, beyond that, uh, he says, Amber actually interviewed one of my colleagues a couple of months ago. He was the man without email. This was back <laughs> in the net at night days. Do you remember that, Amber? Yeah. Yes, I do. I'm going to look up his name right now. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll find it while you continue the email. Okay. Here at IBM, that's where Luis works. We use IBM Connections as our microblogging and wiki and social platforms. There are other vendors, though. Jive Software is one. Uh, Cisco has uh, the quad offering. NewsGator, which was built on SharePoint. A lot of companies use that. Social Text, just to name a few. And then he also points us to the Enterprise 2.0 conference, which is over. It took place in Boston. Um, but he says, let's see, it's, I think it's E2, well, let me just, E2. E2 Conf. E2 Conf, oh, yeah. Are you looking at, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. E2Conf.com, which, um, not, I mean, it, it is, it, it already happened, but it has a lot of um, just good, I, I, I mean, just good uh, resources. That's the word I'm looking for. Resources for anybody who's interested in this sort of stuff. So this is this is social for the enterprise. And sometimes I feel like these are the better resources uh, to to share with people because you know there's only so much that I know about uh, social enterprise tools because we use the ones that work for us. And obviously, Amber, I mean, you run your own consulting and speaking and 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 um interpretive dance. business yes and i mean and i'm at a very small company i mean it's we're bigger than we used to be but it's still a small company so certain tools work for us but obviously just depending on the size of your company and what you need what you need to do and how you need to be social the tools will always change so e2conf.com seems like a very good resource just to figure out who's in the space what are people using and what's working well for everybody yeah, and um, just in reference to having uh, uh, our guest on the show from IBM uh, previously on a, uh, a past episode of uh, Net at Night, um, his site is uh, elsua.net, so E-L-S-U-A dot net. He has a really, really great uh, blog there that isn't necessarily affiliated with uh, IBM, but he talks a lot about his work there. Um, he has an interesting post, too, about uh, Google Plus and uh, how he's using that tool. So a really another great resource that we'll add to your list. Awesome. All right, Amber, before we get to your rad or fad, we want to thank Netflix for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour, episode 17, in fact. We are a teen. We are teenagers, Amber. But not for long. We're going to be adults next week <laughs> and in our brand new studio. Thank goodness, Sarah. So many of our, our listeners and our viewers are already Netflix subscribers. So I feel almost silly telling you how Netflix works because, of course, you know that it's awesome. You get instant streaming movies or TV shows that you can watch straight through your TV if you've got a nice Netflix app like uh, my Sony Bravia does. Uh, variety of game consoles, the Wii, Xbox 360, and so on and so forth. Uh, through your Roku box, through your Apple TV. I mean, this is just instantly. You want to watch Kick-Ass? Sorry to say the A word, but it's really a movie. You can do great that. Movie. And you don't even have to think about it too much. You just go ahead and instantly stream. Quality's great. That's, uh, that's how I prefer to use Netflix. But of course, they also have their DVD service, which is how many people learned about Netflix way back in the day. And they've been around for a long time. They obviously changed up their pricing uh, recently, which ruffled some feathers, but might actually work out better for other people. For example, if you just want the DVD service, you no longer have to sign up for both. You can actually just go, go just DVD or just instant streaming. Um, and of course, you have the option to bundle them together for a little bit more. What's really cool about uh, being a Twit viewer slash listener, whatever you end up being, and you're interested in Netflix, is that you can get 30 days of content for free. So that's movies, that's TV shows, series, you could you could just go incredibly nuts. I mean, think about how many hours within 30 days you could devote to watching stuff. Good movies, classics, new releases, everything in between. You know, The Fighter just came out on uh, Netflix and some streaming. Such a good movie if you haven't seen it before. It's R-rated, so keep that in mind. But it is really, really, really good movie. I really recommend that. Um, Netflix.com slash twit is the website, so they know that you came through us. And again, I mean, it's if, if, if you already have Netflix, you know that it rocks. 
And if you if you know somebody who you know maybe they don't have a great broadband connection, um, or they would just it's someone who's who's a little bit older who's like I don't know about that instant streaming, but I love the idea of giving. DVDs in the mail, uh, let them know about it. Let them know about Netflix and send them to netflix.com slash twit so we get a little credit for helping spread the word and we thank them so much for supporting us. As always, it's nice to be supported. And now it is time for Amber's Rad or Fat. Rad or fad? This is a, there's a lot of pressure on this segment, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to find something that is either good or really, really bad. Um, so uh, this particular uh, item is actually a product. Um, it is from Jawbone. You're probably familiar with Jawbone. They make those great Bluetooth headsets. Yeah, really high. yeah. I used um, to use one all the time. Yeah, just beautiful devices. In fact, uh, they also do a jam box, like this little portable speaker uh, that I've been using a lot lately that I love. And uh, now they have come out with a uh, a new sensor wristband. So the idea behind this wristband is that they're trying to get into the health market. So you would wear this wristband and uh, using vibration and motion sensors, this wrist wristband will track data about your eating, sleeping, and activity patterns. Uh, you would interact with this wristband and all of that data on a smartphone app on your iPhone or Android phone. And uh, it could potentially prompt you to do things. And I'll give you an example that they share here in the Read Write Web article is that let's say, for example, you know, it it, the wristband realizes through data that uh, you haven't you've been sleeping and, and you didn't get a lot of sleep well they could prompt you in the morning to eat a really healthy breakfast you know lots of protein drink lots of water because they realize that um, hey you need that extra bit of uh, nutrition on that morning so um, it's a health wristband uh, that is uh, extremely high tech uh, I'm not sure if people are going to wear this I, I, I haven't quite figured out where I stand in this one Sarah how, how are you thinking right now so I like the I like the idea of this I know in in the article I noticed that they they make the comparison to the Fitbit, which is what yeah. that was my original thought was. Ooh, is this like Fitbit or is it something different? It, I mean, it sounds similar. So I mean, this is the Jawbone Up would be a wristband that you would wear, and you think, well, is that gonna bother me? I don't know. I don't know how comfortable it is because it's still it's something that you you're you have to sign up for. It's not actually anything that's I guess available yet. It's coming soon. But the Fitbit is like a clip-on device, and I have I have friends who who use it religiously because they're trying to be as active as possible, or they'll say, oh, you know, I want to make sure I take 8,000 steps this week, or you know, they have kind of funny goals for themselves. But I also hear a lot about how it's not really very reliable, or it breaks, or there's mm -hmm. data missing from a whole day of exercise. So if if Jawbone can do the Fitbit model better, um, and it looks like it might even be a little bit cuter because it's like a little uh, bendy type thing rather than like a silly little clip on. I could be into this. It would just have yeah. to work. It would have to work well. I think you're right, but the only thing, and they touch on this in the article, and the only thing that uh, I think pushes it a little bit further into kind of the rad category is that uh, Jawbone really has some stellar products, you know, right. and uh, um, everything I've ever used of theirs, uh, I don't work for them uh, at all, but everything I've ever used of theirs does work really well, and it looks really good. I mean, it tends to be a little bit expensive. You sort of pay for uh, better functionality. So, um, hey, it could work. It reminds me a lot. I was watching, um, it was one of the head execs from, uh, Nike. He was doing an interview, I believe it was with Oprah, and he was talking about his work with uh, Lance Armstrong mm -hmm. and the uh, Livestrong brace, wristbands, you know, those yellow uh, uh, wristbands yes. that... Um, you know, people, millions and millions of people bought. Uh, but he was explaining that uh, when they first came up with this idea, he was like, ah, that's never going to work. People aren't going to wear these ugly plastic wristbands, right? You see and, them all the time, years later. Yeah, you, you see them all the time. So uh, who knows? Uh, maybe they've broken uh, the way, they've made it easier for people to wear something like this. And you're right, the product does look kind of slick. So maybe it's it's maybe it's almost rad. So you've got, yeah, you've got you've got a you've got your little bracelet. Uh, assuming that you're the kind of person who I don't know doesn't have like a watch on both wrists already. So you you've got room to add a bracelet, and it looks like it'll it'll accommodate fat wrists because uh, you've got a little bit of room to expand. And then what are you trying to say, Sarah? I I, I didn't say you, Amber. I just <laughs> said sometimes people, you know, so if I eat a little too much salt, my wrist. Starts to feel like maximum capacity. Just saying. They've got like an app. What I love is the eating habits part of it because sleep patterns, some of us are, you know, the, the Fitbit folks are, you know, familiar with um, 
that uh, um, devices and services that are supposed to help you learn when you're in REM sleep and are you getting good sleep and are you moving around too much? Are you too hot? What's the temperature like? But eating habits, um, that's where I, I find that I need the most help. Um, yeah. And if somehow up can, I guess you have to, there's a certain amount of honesty when you decide to use products like this where you, you, you just, you, you have to be honest about what you're consuming because how would it know otherwise? Um, and that it can start offering really good health advice based on what you're putting into your body and how much sleep you're getting and how much you're walking around. I kind of like it. Yeah, it's neat. You know who would be great for this? Leo. Yes. Leo would wear He would wear this. He would. He's, Leo is, uh, he loves this kind of stuff. He um, does. Have I'm going to try to get Leo. Have you seen his blood pressure monitor? Yeah, I've seen <laughs> He always has, you know, everything from the uh, Withings Wi-Fi scale that broadcasts his way to, um, I, I think he'd be into this. I'm going to try to, maybe I can get him sent one or something. <laughs> maybe Leo can be our up guinea pig. Where I love it. We just see if it works for somebody uh, first, and then we can decide if we think it's rad. I have to say, okay, if, we, if, we, if we're forced to choose rad or fad, just based on what we know now and again, I'm just going to enter my email address right now because I want to, <laughs> I want to, I want to. I'll try this out. I want to sign up as soon as possible. If I have to say rad or fad now, based on the concept, I'm going to say rad. Okay. I think it sounds pretty I think cool. I'm with you on this, Sarah, and I think, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's worth testing out even. Cool. All right. That's up from Jawbone. Uh, obviously, go to jawbone.com and put in your email address if you're interested in signing up like I just did. And uh, with that, Amber, I think we've come to the end of our delightful program. Almost a perfect hour, Sarah. Or close great? to it, I think. Yeah. It was a, a good show, and uh, we'll have to get a guest for next week. I have a couple of ideas about guests that we can have, so I'll work on the guests for next week. Okay, sounds good. And in the meantime, again, reminder that uh, if all goes well, and I think that we are going to keep this room intact, at least we're going to just overlap a little bit. Exactly. Just in case, just in case next Monday no one's ready and we're all running around, you know, like chickens with their head cuts off, cut, cut off. <laughs> heads cut off, that uh, we will still have this set up that I can screw up as I do every Monday. Um, so the show will go on. It will either be here, but most likely it'll be in our new studio um, Love with it. Amber's disembodied head sitting on a chair. And that might be really a lot of fun. Um, so definitely support us and tune in and, and see what we end up coming up with uh, next Monday. And Amber, you and I, of course, can talk about guest ideas in the meantime. And enjoy course, Vegas. Sarah. Stay cool. I will. I'll stay cool. And uh, I will uh, see everybody next week. All right. Reminder that we are live Monday, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Our website is twit.tv slash TSH. You can find our show on iTunes. I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Amber MacArthur, and I'll see you online. See you guys. Bye-bye. Adding their own stuff to it. Right, right. Yeah, and I, and I, you know, I... Is that you, Amber? Sorry, I just sneezed. <laughs> Seeing the comments of people suggesting other songs. I mean, that's a really fulfilling experience. Okay, I have to sneeze. Hold on. Hold on. This is the best part of the show. Okay. It's oh! Sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm I so what frustrated. A what a so letdown. So close. Leo, every time I do this show with you, I sneeze. This is drop. You've lost money. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> minutes and I just go yay thank you thanks for putting the time into doing this because uh, people like me and I know people like both of you and I'm sure a lot of people who are listening and watching when you're interacting with companies because more and more companies oh, yeah. will have at least one person who's managing the Twitter account and often a team of folks that are kind of the social network liaisons and we got a lot of feedback um, some of it was Sarah I only have 50 followers or yes, but I almost I was avoiding a huge <laughs> sneeze and I had Excuse me. Um, I almost sneezed. I love it. All right. Yeah, like a, oh, like sorry, a... I'm going to sneeze again, so I better go. Okay, Amber. Because <laughs> oh, I'm tight.